Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mick van der Wegen. In the chat, I saw some of you being there. And welcome to IHC alumni and for all interested people. Um, I think if you are interested in mangroves, you know already how important they are. Um, for me, it concerns basically three aspects. Uh, one is the, um, the ecosystem services and the natural values that they have. Um, also the cultural values. The other is the role they may play in carbon sequestration, where Sebion will talk about. And they have a major role also in coastal protection, uh, protecting the hinterland. And you can see that very nicely on this picture, protecting the hinterland uh, from storm waves or higher waves, um, uh, because they attenuate the waves and they take care that the, the levee system is, is uh, not attacked by, by very large waves. And it is a major question how these systems like this, how they will behave under climate change and, and sea level rise, for example. Are they still there? Um, and, and if not, how will they adapt to sea level rise? And what are the time scales associated with that? So I've been working on that the past uh, eight years uh, together with my esteemed colleagues, uh, Dano Rufink and also Sebian, who did his PhD with us, um, Uwe Best, who is still busy, Jasper Dijkstra from Beltaras, and Johan Reins, who also played a, a major role in, in the guidance and, and the software programming uh, of, of this. So you can see here a very nice uh, coastline. This is Guyana. And you can indeed see the extent of the mangroves. Um, um, and and the, the strange thing here is that um, if you go to this place, but then uh, 30 years later, you, you come to this uh, site and you see that the mangroves have vanished and that the coastline uh, is totally exposed to, um, uh, to wave attack and, and that you really have to make good coastal protection to protect uh, this hinterland. And you may question yourself, hey, these dikes are now safe, huh? or they protect us from overtopping. Um, but what will happen if there's two meters of extra sea level rise? What, what is happening with this uh, uh, landscape? Um, and it probably may result in these type of landscapes in the near future because of sea level rise, but also because of uh, um, uh, um, subsidence huh? that takes place because of groundwater extraction of or of um, uh, mining uh, oil mining and gas mining well this is a nice plot it's not for myself but it is uh, indicating where the mangroves are and uh, just a very brief mentioning that also different types of mangroves huh? and i was kind of intrigued by starting all this research on on well how, how all these mangroves and, and these mangrove systems how they behave is there a kind of equilibrium in in their development and, and how would they react to disturbances um, of the forcing in terms of waves and tides and sediment supply and sea level rise. And that is what I want to talk about um, in the coming uh, minutes. Um, going back to Guyana, the Guyana coastline is very pe peculiar because you have sediment supply by the Amazon River. Um, and you can see the Amazon River over here. Uh, that is providing sediments towards the coast, fine sediments that kind of travel along the coast, um, not only in suspension, but also by mi migrating mud banks. And these are 25, 50 kilometer long mud banks, and they travel towards the, the west in, in cycles of about 20 to 40 years. Um, and, and the extent of these mud banks, they, they kind of extend 40 kilometer in the shore, so you have a very uh, shallow foreshore uh, when they are there. And if they are not there, um, you saw that in the previous pictures, you, you have um, uh, quite some decent wave attack on, on the coast. Um, so if you want to understand these systems, what you do is you start making models. And I will start by doing that in a very simple way. Well, we, we take a, a stretch of coast or a profile and we are going to see what the processes are and um, 
and then we um, we make the process formulations for this, like like wave action, tidal movement, uh, sediment supply, uh, sediment movement, and erosion and deposition. And if you put all that in, um, uh, in you can put that in in uh, in a nice MATLAB routines, and then we added the mangroves, yeah, because the mangroves they, they have an impact on on the tides and the waves, um, and and. But the vegetation has also an impact on the morpho dynamics because the roots are growing. That means that the bed level will come up, and also there's litter by 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 um, by leaves, huh? and so there's some kind of, kind of bio accumulation as well. Um, but also the morpho dynamic development itself has impact on the vegetation because some areas are higher than other areas and if mangroves are too high they cannot survive also and and, and finally there's also the impact by tides and waves on the vegetation because uh, they disturb basically uh, the sediment around the trees and, and if the waves on the velocities become too high they can excavate basically the entire tree so there's a total amount of a lot of feedback processes that are in uh, and we also added that uh, to the model basically you 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 have a stretch like this um and with the full hydrodynamic movement of waves and tides the sediment movement the morphodynamics or so the bed level developments and the dynamics of the the trees themselves the growth and the starvation of these trees and we we try to model that and to see if if, if a system like this which is very non-linear a lot of dynamics going on if there's an equilibrium possible and this is the uh, the result of that model. The y-axis you can see time from zero to eighty years, and on the x-axis you can see uh, what is happening on on the profile. So this is from two thousand to thirty-five. So it's about fifteen hundred meters, where the right-hand side of this picture is is the land. Eh? It's the coastline. It's the dike, and here you can see the mangrove diameter development over time. So initially there's nothing. And then because there is sediment supply, the mangroves can start growing in terms of diameter and height of the number of plants. And there's all kinds of limiters for the growth and, and competition amongst the, the mangroves. And that finally results in, in, in bed levels. Uh, and they kind of evolve after 80 years to a kind of equilibrium situation. So that's always nice if models, they want to have equilibrium because um, then you, you can uh, see um, then the model is under control and you can systematically explore impacts of, of varying uh, boundary conditions. Um, so this is what we did, and we kind of made different boundary conditions along this line by 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 less sediment supply and wave height uh, by changing that, and that's kind of mimicking the mud bank migration along the Guyana coastline, and you can see the cyclic behavior over 160 years of time, huh, where the mangroves they grow, uh, and but because if they're in terms that there is less sediment supply in higher waves um, the bed level erodes and, and also the mangroves they vanish and you get this uh, cyclic behavior um, in the final step well, we then say also imposed uh, over these 160 years we also imposed sea level rise of half a meter a meter and two meter and then you can see that the cyclicity is still there under very small sea level rise scenarios, but under the higher sea level rise scenarios, you still see the cyclicity. Yeah, so the 30 year cycles of uh, of the mud bank migration, but in the end, the mangroves cannot survive there anymore uh, because um, it, the, the, the system is drowning and there's too much inundation. Um, so some concluding remarks from my side is that the mangroves play an important role in coastal protection by the attenuation of waves. And we developed a very simple 1D model. As an academic, you always start very simple. That is describing the cross-shore dynamics uh, with feedback processes between mangroves, the hydrodynamic sediments, and the morphodynamics. And you can very clearly see that the mangrove belt follows the morph dynamic developments. I mean, the, the existence of mangroves and, and their dynamics of mangroves does not impact the, um, the system on these very large timescales. It's basically following the bed level developments uh, 
Yeah, and because the bed level developments uh, basically lag behind sea level rise, the mangroves, they, they slowly drown under high sea level rise scenarios over 100 years. Well, this is basically just an overview of uh, what we have been doing. Um, and uh, next steps, they include two-dimensional runs, uh, making life a little bit more complex. Um, but I'm sure that my colleague um, Sebrian can, uh, will talk about that. And uh, finally, Daniel will take things over again, and he will introduce, for example, the longshore dynamics uh, of mangrove mud flat systems. So thank you for, um, for your uh, uh, attention, and I'm looking forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Mika. And I would like to pass the floor to Sebrian Veseli Putra, who will talk about simulation mangrove mud flood dynamics with an IRI eco hydromorphodynamic model optimizing mangroves carbon sequestration potential. Sebrian, the floor is yours. Thank you. That's a pointer. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mick, for a nice presentation and the introduction of our research in uh, mangrove in our group at IG Delft. So uh, I'd like to share about my PhD research on simulating the mangrove mafet dynamics with this uh, new so-called hybrid eco hydromorphodynamic model that we are trying to couple this vegetation uh, dynamic modeling by individually based model of mangrove and couple it with landscape scale hydromorphodynamic model. So this work is not done by myself. It is I have a lot of supports from my uh, supervisors, so that my promoter, uh, Professor Dan Rolfing, uh, my co-promoter, uh, Mick van der Wehen, and also my other supervisors, Jesper Dexter from Delta Res, uh, Johan Reins from Aichi, and Uwe Gruters from uh, Hiesen in Germany. So uh, let me start with this presentation. So when you know that from the previous presentation by Mick that uh, we have this different type of species of mangroves with different type of uh, routing systems, different uh, canopy types, different stems, and different behavior on, let's say, uh, anticipating the hydrodynamic forcings and so on. Well, if you know about this, then we should know as well about the roles of mangroves. And if we want to connecting it with the climate change, then mangroves has a big role on climate mitigations, which is, you can be seen from here that uh, we try to mitigate as many as greenhouse, greenhouse cases available in the atmosphere. And also in climate mitigate, uh, adaptation, we use mangrove to adapt on, on climate change, for instance, on that role in wave attenuation effect. Well, well you know that mangrove is not as in a good condition right now that in the, from the from the eighties that we know the record that uh, mangrove forest has been declining, even though the rate of the declining is now getting decreased. But if you took an example, for instance, uh, of the this significant mangrove loss in Indonesia, especially in the mark uh, in Central Java, that once the mangrove is gone or disappear, then we know this cascading effect that once mangrove is gone, then we know this lot of huge erosion is happening afterwards. But of course, it is not on the mistake of the mangrove. It's in the mark that we know that is, it is coupled with land, subs and land, with land subsidence. But well, you know that from the back of the history that as long as the mangrove is there, they are providing such kind of, of, of the buffers from these processes because you know that uh, they are producing litters that can also contribute to the bed level development. They capture the sediments and they also helping to to constrain all of these input sediments and they can still, well, uh, somewhat protecting the coast. So in order to do that, that we need to understand on how the mangrove and soil are interacting within each other. And you know that mangrove is not static. They are living being and therefore they have this life cycle. So when we look back at on how the interactions of mangroves that maybe we can, uh, let's say, slice on vertically on the three, three parts. So you have the subsurface processes, which is basically they are really have long and slow development of that. That is basically 
correlated with uh, this geological time scale that is have a very very slow and long processes and we know when we have this somewhat more active which is happening in surface processes in where the rooting systems of mangrove that interact with this uh, biophysic oh, sorry uh, the the abiotic drivers such as from the sediment transport the first water and seawater and waves and they interacted in between each others and we have this uh, let's say uh, root growths that they have also different uh, responses to different uh, abiotic drivers and not so that that we have this atmospheric let's say uh, drivers that mangrove is also have uh, relied on and when you look at on the life cycle that the mangrove has this different response on the particular condition as well so for instance that you have the mangrove first they appear as a propagules which is like kind of a small seedlings and as long as the environment is good enough for instance let the inundation level is low and they dry for such kind of uh, quite quite a long time that we know this is part of the windows of opportunity opportunity that this propagule can uh, let's say colonize the new development and then they can appear as a seedlings and in the stage of the seedling itself they have these different results so as long as you don't have large waves that can topple the, the seedlings or as long as the sedimentation is not high enough so it is not buried by the sediment then the seedling can grow into a sapling stage and we can imagine this as a life cycle of a human being so you have this baby you have this toddler and you have this teenager and eventually you can move as an adult or or, or mature trees so we need to understand how the response of the mangrove for each their life scale because the thresholds of propagule is different of the seedlings and different of from that sapling condition so then when we know how they uh, the mangrove interacts or within their physical environmental forcings then we can hopefully better predict on their uh the processes so then the goal of the research of my PhD research is to gain a better insight into complex echogromophic interactions and the feedback processes in coastal mangrove and eventually to develop uh, trustworthy tools for predicting their dynamics. Uh, well, in order to do that, that uh, in my PhD, we look at these three sequence. So then first we need to understand on how this various time scale is varying along this, this mangrove dynamics. And then the second is based on this information, then we develop this uh, two-dimensional uh, specially explicit model of mangrove method dynamics that we can couple this vegetation dynamics and this landscape scale hydromorphodynamic itself. And at the end, we apply this model to optimize the mangrove restoration strategies, of course, in to support the carbon sequestration function. So uh, in order to do that, then we couple so I mentioned this earlier that we couple this individual base uh, mangrove vegetation dynamic with the F3D flexible mesh, which is a landscape uh, model of the hydromorphodynamic processes. So what kind of uh, biotic and abiotic processes that is involved that are involved in the model? So of course we look at the physical drivers. What will be the variation uh, forcings of fluvial tide waves and sediment transport into the mangroves? And what will be the environmental drivers for now? It is salinity to mangrove. Because we know that mangrove is grows in two ways. First, it's, it grows vertically, which is like vertical growth that they can grow from, from uh, propagule to seedling to saplings to mature trees. They grow vertically as a height. And they can also grow in horizontally, which is in lateral dimension that they can occupy new space or we can uh, see the dieback of the mangroves. So uh, when we have the initial mangrove conditions with their uh, species distributions and, the, and their, their, uh, their mangrove stance properties, then we see the responses of the physical uh, of mangroves from their physical drivers, which can be as, uh, as at wave attenuation effect as on how the flow is, has been altered and will be the morphological development afterwards. And of course, if you have the changes on, on environmental driver, we should expect the response on, for instance, permutal salinity and soil nutrient balance. But in the model, we are not talking uh, into detail into that, that portions. And once we have these mangrove conditions and also the, the, 
the forcings from the physical and environmental drivers, then we expect that uh, we have the responses of mangrove on the growths and also on the three to three competitions. And when we have this extreme condition of the of the forcings, such as huge uh, sedimentation, uh, sediment supply or uh, big waves is coming, so then we see that there is a mortality. So the mortality of the mangrove is dependent on how they have the competition within each others, that their competitions on the resources, on the nutrients, and then how on on how and also on how the mortality is controlled by the let's say the 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 window of opportunity when they are uh, trying to uh, transform from seedlings to to saplings. So in this condition that we try to parameterize and try to include the effect of physical drivers on their dispersals of the proper goals and the establishments on the on the on the saplings and how long it will be it will be recovered. So then in the sense that we have this full uh closed loop cycles of the mangrove development from the initial mangrove that they also have the street to three competition that will drive on the mortality and what will be the production of the mangrove as a seedlings and how the seedlings can establish into saplings and so on. So then we have this closed loop. So in order to test this work, then we put that into a schematized model that is taking place in a Porong Delta. So then we uh, try to, to schematize, to simplify the processes as in the Delta as in, in, a, in the final shape model. Then we force this, this model just into these two seasonal uh, forcing from wet season and dry seasons. And you know that, that once we place the, the small uh, seedlings onto this, this, this delta, we see that they start to grow, and the effect of this this current will will also uh, bring the seedlings into the new well established area. So as long as this uh, the mudflat is good enough for them to grow, to so then the 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 seedlings can establish and they can grow into the mature trees. You see from this graph that they are interacting interacting between each other. So once you have the mangrove, so then you see that this uh, affecting the flow, and you see that it will be also affecting the morphological development at the back. And once we we have this uh, the new bed level emerging, then uh, when the seeding is is transported by the currents into that particular locations, and as long as it is dry enough, to, then they can establish and settle as a new uh, the mangrove. So well, uh, when we test it, it is not bad enough. So in terms of uh, vertical development of mangrove, we see that this model can uh, produce almost a good results of that, but not for the lateral expansion. Well, we can understand because in the real case study itself, that the source of the seedling is not only from the delta itself, but we have this uh, another source of seedlings from the vicinity, such as from the northern and the southern uh, land or, or mangrove stands. So then, but in our model, we are limited only in, in our work. But so far, we are satisfied with the results because uh, we have this nice representation of the age uh, development of mangroves and also the shape of the of the delta itself. Well, uh, we are not only looking at this uh, spatial expansion and also the development of delta. We can also see how the mangrove is uh, behaving on different signals. Well, from the uh, presentation from Mick before that we see that mangrove has this seasonal variation. We see it as well in the model that we have this up and down of signal of, of, of the mangrove canopy area development. And when we are changing the forcings, we can also see how the mangrove has different behavior. That in the beginning, we see that there is no much different on different scenarios. They are following almost the same path. But once they are reaching this level of maturity, uh, maturity then we see that they are split into different routes when we, when we uh, provide a lot of supply of sediments that they grow larger, but when are, we are limiting the supply of sediment, they grow. I mean, uh, the area is 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 declining. They have this is very small area. So we see that the uh, mangrove is very sensitive on sediment supply and morphological development. But it is even more clear from this from this plot that uh, we have this high salinity and rich sediment condition. We have this high salinity and poor sediment uh, supply. And we see uh, we have a scenario on 
what if we have low sanity and then rich sentiment conditions? We see that in the first, let's say, 15 or 16 years, they are not so different in mangrove canopy development. But of course, they have this uh, different shape of morphological development. But afterwards, that we know that there is a shift from mangrove as colonizers, as mangrove as a ecosystem engineer, that once we are reaching this certain uh, mangrove density and also this mangrove biophysical properties, they start to, to, to give a role on uh, hydromorphodynamic processes afterwards because they are big enough. Well, if you look back on the, on the image, we have this uh, good model. We have a nice representation of that processes. Now we are looking at the, at the another question that uh, can we optimize the design of mangrove restoration strategies to support carbon sequestration optimizations? Well, it is important because in mangrove conservation, we have to show that mangrove forests, that they are also providing another services. So in order to do that, that we take this model and make it even more simple. And we are questioning myself, ourselves that what happened if we plant mangrove on different uh, tidal elevation position? What if we plant mangrove just right above the mean sea level? What if we plant mangrove just above the uh, the high water nip and high water spring or in combination? So what will be the effect on the morphology and the mangrove itself? So uh, we run the model for 20 years and we compare it in uh, no vegetation conditions. So what you see here that in y-axis is is the, the cross shore distance, and then in x-axis is the average bed level development for certain years. That's we have this quite a surprising results that if you plant the mangrove really close to the insect level, so you see this polygon, it is a representation of the mangrove that they tend to to have the negative effect of morphology that they tend to erode the the, the 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 mudflats, but when you plant the mangrove higher above, then the high water nip that you see that they have this uh, positive feedback on the on the mudflat that they 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 help mudflat to grow in the vertical direction. But the mangrove also have this allowable area that they can also settle and establish themselves. So we you see this this uh, nice feedback of just putting mangrove higher above the high water nip. So uh, when you plot this this carbon stock, that of course you see that so everything above zero in y-axis is the above ground carbon. What is above ground is everything that is above the the ground level. So the rooting system above the ground level, the stem, the canopy. Then whereas the below ground is everything below the ground. So you can also consider the part of the below ground uh, rooting system of the mangrove as part of it, and also the soil organic carbon. What you see here that it is there is not so much different on the above ground carbon for every for all scenarios of the mangroves, but it is totally different when you look at the below ground carbon uh, stock capacity. So when you plant the mangrove and just okay in everything above mean sea level or just below high water reef or above high water reef, it looks like they are they just grow nicely. They are flourishing. They green is good. And when you count it, it is you have this high amount of the, the carbon capacity. But eventually, if you look at the total, it's not. So uh, the, the message of the research is that you need to also consider the below ground capacity when you are doing your conservation. So in summary, that uh, in our research, we show that uh, mangrove has this seasonal variation pattern that by using the uh, drone and multiple sources of imagery, we see that there is a connection within six monthly seasonal forcings and the dependency on the mangrove into that and also the development of the internal morphology. Once we know this uh, seasonal pattern of the mangrove, then we try to, to model it in our model by uh, the so-called uh, DFM phone or the hybrid ecomorphodynamic model that in this model, we can follow the life stage of individual mangroves and the feedback with the physical environmental forcing. And we can also use this model to optimize the restoration that just simply plant the mangrove between the high water nip and the high water spring. 
it can help deposit more sediment and we can see the significant mangrove extent. So, uh, well, uh, this is the end of my presentations. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Maria and Danu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebrian, for your presentation and congratulations for your new diploma and for being a staff member of IHE Delft. And we are going to continue our presentation with Professor Dano Rulfin that will talk about towards a larger scale, long-term modeling of mangrove coastlines. Please, uh, Dano, the floor is yours. And I Hi. want to remember that uh, to everybody to write the questions on the chat, please. Okay, so um, after these uh, uh, well, somewhat detailed uh, explanations by Mick and very detailed explanations by Sebrion, I'm going to uh, take a step back and see what we can do if we need to say something about much larger and longer time scales um, in mangrove coastlines. Uh, so what, what are we talking about then? Uh, for instance, this kind of uh, large-scale system, uh, uh, the Mekong uh, Delta outflow, where you see a, a 3D model simulation of sediment concentrations coming out of the river. Let me see if I can. Uh, yes. Basak River here, for instance, and then moving along shore. And the question is, this is a the very detailed three-dimensional model. Can you do that in a, in a simpler way? And the uh, uh, another example, uh, I don't know if you have that also. Um, another example is the Amazon River outflow where you see a nice uh, satellite image, a composite uh, image, uh, where you see this muddy outflow go along the the Guyana's coast, uh, the, we were talking about British Guiana in, uh, or Guiana uh, in, uh, in, in mix uh, presentation. And one of the questions is, uh, okay, so how far does this mud go and, and what, what introduces these uh, cyclic uh, bank movements, etc.? That would be something nice, but that plays a role in, in decades and, and, and hundreds of kilometers. Um, then another example here in the north coast of Java, some relatively complex uh, delta, muddy delta behavior. But um, is there a way we can try and, and simulate this? Now, one of the problems is, OK, so we have these very large scales and, and years to decades time scales. Uh, so detailed modeling is hardly feasible. Uh, and in sandy coastlines, we have these very convenient concepts uh, like sandy coastline models. Uh, but um, our questions are, how does the mud from a river spread along the coast? And where will it deposit? And what is the role in mangroves uh, of mangroves in this? So, for instance, if you have mud passing in front of a dike, uh, well, then the mud will just, just continue on until it drops into some canyon, but if the if there's mangroves along the way, then they may be able to trap some of that mud. So that plays a role in much larger uh, space scales. Um, so uh, if we look at a model I was talking about for sandy uh, coastlines and the recent shoreline S, I've given another seminar about that. Uh, so you can look that up if you like, uh, but this is uh, can do all sorts of coastal shapes. Uh, but one of the, the interesting things we want to do is uh, is to add mud coasts to that. And now mud it behaves quite differently from uh, from sandy uh, transport, uh, and that uh, that is something that we need to take into account. But so this is what we'll focus on. Uh, a mud coastline model where the, the color here indicates the, the, the sediment concentration. And we have, we schematize everything that happens near shore to a single near shore area uh, where the flow is driven by wind and waves. Uh, and the waves and the currents, they stir up uh, the mud and, uh, and there's mud coming out of the rivers. and. We use a one-dimensional alongshore advection equation to solve this 
And in that, you can include the effect of uh, rivers and mangroves and sea level rise. And that then ends up in this one equation I'll show you. So the, 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 the rate of change of the normal direction, so the, the cross-shore movement of the coast depends on the longshore gradient of sediment transport and the sea level rise and the uh, exchange that we have with uh, mangroves and rivers. Uh, and this leads to fundamentally different uh, uh, re behavior uh, compared to uh, uh, compared to coastline uh, sandy coastlines. Here's an example where a recent uh, master student Maria Josen um, compared this this approach with uh, with Del 3D models, which are not so easy to set up. I can tell you. Uh, it is an example of a, a delta formation and the sediment concentration that you see. Uh, and we can compare that uh, with uh, what happens if you have a, a shoreline M, uh, as this new model is called, uh, which produces this kind of bulge. It's much simpler than this more complex feature. But if you look through your eyelashes, then, then well, with some... Uh, benevolence you you will see some uh, uh, some agreement between those two and and we have looked more in detail and and we see that that the basic uh, properties and parameters are similar between those models um now for the cross row schematization and i here, here use a nice image by Delhi, that was uh, my colleague Jan Boersma uh, uh, in, uh, at Del Tires produced. So what we need to do is to schematize the exchange between the shelf and nearshore, a mudflat and mangroves. And we uh, want to do that in a way that is really much simpler than, uh, than what uh, uh, Sebrian or even uh, what uh, Mick uh, uh, proposed. Uh, so this is uh, more a behavior model where we give the, the coastline and the, and the mangroves some uh, limited uh, degrees of freedom uh, so they can move backwards and forwards. And, and there is a, a growth of the mangroves depending on the tidal exchange. Uh, and uh, everything is led by the propagation or erosion of the coastline, and, and that depends on the on uh, the horizontal balance of the longshore fluxes. And you can um, put this into uh, some uh, some relationships. I sorry, I promised no more no more equations, but uh, you don't have to. Uh, worry too much about that. Uh, in terms of uh, computation time, this is very, very simple. Uh, but the, the, the main thing is that you have some rules for mudflat and mangrove behavior as a function of the sediment concentration, coastline change, and the tide. And those rules we intend to sharpen uh, by using uh, Sabrians and mix uh, models and knowledge from the field. And then once you get that, you can do simulations like this, where we have two types of mangroves, let's say the, the, the more established mangroves on, on the slope. Uh, we have mangroves colonizing a mud flat, and we have the mud flat itself. So here we have been, been first feeding sediment to, to this coast and then to, to that part of the coast. And in the meantime, the sediment is spread along the coast and produces this kind of, of behavior. And we think this is starting to look somewhat realistic, but we're not that much further than that. Um, here's, uh, uh, again, colleague uh, Jan Boersma at Del Tares, who has done uh, very preliminary simulations of a of a, a, a bay, uh, an embayment in, uh, in New Zealand, where there's a couple of rivers coming out and there has been uh, observed mangrove growth. And he has tried to simulate that with this uh, 
shoreline M uh, model. And the nice thing is what you see is that there is some, uh, if you're uh, kind again, uh, you see some agreement between the kind of shapes that are predicted here uh, and and the kind of of mangrove belt and mud flat that you that you see there. So these are just initial uh, efforts, and uh, uh, what we we can conclude so far is that the comparison between the L3D and shoreline M without mangroves. Well, it's it's not easy to do it in the L3D, but uh, it is relatively easy to do it in uh, in shoreline M, although. Uh, and that's not so difficult because it's much easier model. Uh, but the behavior of coastline is fundamentally different from mud coast than for sandy coasts. If you have a source of a river in, in a sandy coast, then typically you get a sort of symmetrical uh, uh, behavior. In, uh, in muddy coasts, it, it goes, the sediment part goes much more to the downdrift side. But uh, at least for so far, uh, the simple mangrove model seems to give realistic results. Um, but what are the next steps? Well, we need to collect conclusions on a heuristic or, hell, let's say, uh, uh, behavior model of the mangrove response. And we can test that in a point model for a given time series of concentration. Um, and then we want to do principal tests at a realistic scale, like the Kamau Peninsula, Vietnam, and also the Guianas coast. And of course, we need to write the manuals, etc. But important is to find partners and potential funding to give this development a boost. And we're getting some initial funding from the Deltaris Research uh, Fund. And we use our own uh, research efforts, but that is, uh, of course, uh, relatively speaking, peanuts. Um, in the longer run, what we would like to do is to integrate wave and tide profile model that's already in shoreline S. And that um, we may end up with something that is similar to, to, to MFLAT that uh, Mick was talking about and really integrate that in two dimensions, to add the longshore dimension to that. And we have uh, ideas of how to do that and add the vegetation effects and the bottom change. We think that is still doable at large scales uh, with 100 to, to uh, kilometer longshore resolution uh, covering um, uh, hundreds of kilometers. Um, so that is uh, basically what I wanted to say. It's work in progress. Uh, we're excited about uh, the, the potential, but uh, much has to be proven yet. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Danner, and to all our speakers. And uh, without further ado, we are going to go to the questions that I thank you very much to Mick that has also taken the lead to answer some questions on the chat. And um, maybe Mick, you would like to address the first question and the second one that was uh, also answered by you in the chat. You are, yeah. Yes, I can. Um... But there are so many questions. Uh, I will go down to maybe you can the, yes to the first. Read the first the one was yeah. Is, so the first question was about the software that was used for simulating the mangrove coast and the behavior over time. Yeah, and that question we've was by about, Verina. Uh, yeah, we we've been talking about software. Um, MFLAT, that was my presentation, that is open source, freely available, MATLAB based. Um, just write me an email and I will send it. Um, and then Sebion dealt with um, Delft 3D FM and uh, Mesofon, so the DFM fun. Um, that is also freely available, albeit that the Deltara software needs uh, some, for, uh, well, uh, you need to have a license for that. 
to, to run uh, Delft. But also that is kind of open source available via Deltara's website. I can put that in the chat, I think. Um, and then Dano, maybe you can comment on the status of your software. <laughs> yeah, well, the, 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 this has been implemented in the, in the Shoreline S uh, uh, code, which is available through, uh, uh, I'll, I'll write that, it's simple shoreline s dot n l you can uh, also that, that is a, a github site and uh, and there you get a recent version of uh, of shoreline s that also includes this uh, this man mangrove and mud uh, facility but uh, the the documentation of that is is very rudimentary so uh, i would uh, recommend to, uh, to 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 be in contact if you want to to uh, to start working on that. Okay, and uh, we can also, you can send me the some links of uh, some programs you want to share and I can include it also in the email that we will send to all of them with the contact detail of all of you. Here is a question that uh, come from Libya and he said, could the floods that have recently taken place in Libya have been avoided if the environment was developed in the same way as a man of the mangrove? I don't know who would like to address the question, answer the question. Well, uh, I can yeah. have a go at it. Um, of course, I think these floods were mainly uh, related to the, to the breaching of a dam, uh, that uh, barrier uh, far inland. And I think that that is, a large extent uh, lack of maintenance uh, I suppose but also uh, uh, perhaps not 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 a correct uh, operation and also it could be degradation of the of the uh, of the uh, land area leading to to way too fast runoff uh, but uh, I must say that, uh, in general, of course, you need to maintain all your 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 defense, uh, your water retaining structures, and uh, try to to uh, maintain your your environment in a, in a way that uh, that makes it easier to deal with extreme conditions. Even though those extreme conditions are getting more extreme, right? and so you cannot avoid everything. Thank you, Dano. And now there is a question that comes from Bangladesh for from Mr. Tuhid, addressed to Sabrian and to Mike. And um, the question is, did you explore the potential of geospatial remote sensing data in your study, other than hydrodynamic models to evaluate the potentials of wave attenuating and mangrove restoration process opportunity? Yeah. Yes, I can share this. So, yeah, in our research that we, at first, we, uh, let's say, explore the use of remote sensing analysis to detect the seasonal changes of the mangroves and also mm -hmm. the detailed description of the species itself in the mudflat in somewhat limited way. Uh, because in our work that, uh, I think uh, we have shared the link to the paper in the chat, in the chat box. Uh, of course, that is the first stage of to do that, but I understand that in the restoration uh, activities that you need a more detailed description of mangrove itself. Well, whereas in the remote sensing, you are somewhat limited to, let's say, 10 by 10 meter resolutions from Sentinel products and to even smaller 30 by 30 meters from the the Landsat. So then in the in our first paper that we show you that you can combine the more highly uh, detailed uh, from the drone imagery analysis and combine it with the uh, satellite imagery, then you can have a larger uh, scale of a view on the mangrove itself. And uh, when we are also considering the effect of another hydrodynamic process on that, for instance, wave conditions and so on and so on, and yes, uh, we already include that in our work, but well, yeah, uh, it is still under review. So hopefully that uh, it is already published and we can share it later on in the 
I believe that it is in an IG platform and probably also in the YouTube recording afterwards. Yeah. Thank you very much. Professor Gopakumar from India re asked, what are the strategies for mitigating the impact of sea level rise on mangrove ecosystems in different geographical contexts? Who would like to answer? Very good, very good question. <laughs> And we so far we have been uh, developing software to 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 describe the system, and we have been looking for validation cases uh, to, to uh, also for uh, see how well the software is doing. And the next step, indeed, is about if we want to maintain or promote mangrove growth. Um, what can we do about it and what kind what type of measures can we take and, and and can we also put that into models like permeable dams or uh, sediment supply or clever dredging and deposition strategies or huh? and and these type of scenarios we are now ready to explore but indeed it remains quite difficult because there is not much data to validate our models so it, it remains quite qualitative uh, exercise, I would say. And I, I would also say that the, the options are, uh, of course, and we were faced with a, often with a double whammy of uh, sea level rise and a reduction of the sediment supply. Uh, and, uh, and well, so it's, uh, it's definitely not easy. And uh, I think there, the, on a strategic level, you also have to to consider whether whether retreating can be can be an option, uh, uh, because of course, putting everything into concrete will uh, uh, will not solve things in the in the very long run. But yeah, one of the strategies could be to to bring in sediment from offshore or from from a, a larger continental shelf, uh, uh, because the the main problem is is the lack of sediment to to uh, compensate for the sea level rise. We have uh, many questions, so I will uh, request if I can can continue four minutes uh, to the speakers. And the next question is from Marcela Busnelli from the Netherlands. Could you comment on the theory that mangroves could mitigate sea level re rise by creating sedimentation island inland? Sorry. Mangroves influence on the morphology. That's always very. That's a, that's a debate. I mean, um, if you haven't, well, we can model um, mangrove belts in equilibrium in in our uh, models. So if the, if that is true, that remains to be explored. But um, there will be some truth in it. Um, if you start imposing sea level rise, that means that the morphodynamic development, it lags behind the sea level rise. So if you put a little bit of sea level rise in and keep it constant, then, then the system will automatically adapt uh, to the new equilibrium conditions. Um, if you have continuing sea level rise, the, the morphodynamic development, so the bed level development, always lags behind. Yeah. Um, so and the nice thing about mangroves is that um, they also provide litter and organic matter. So um, in addition to the bed level developments of, of the sediments, you also have increase of, of biomass in, in your bed. Huh? And that may just, just give that extra um, uh, bed level change required to keep up with sea level rise. Although if you... So there's two drawbacks on that. So the, the bed level changes are not for the entire system everywhere the same. So they were will be more closer to the sources of sediment, whereas the more landward portions will, will more lag behind. Um, and, and the other thing is that this bioaccumulation is, is maybe for limited sea level rise, is that okay? But for the larger, like one meter or two meter level sea level rise per, per, per century, it, it, it is not enough probably. Okay, I will uh, close with this question that has not been answered in the chat, and I will try to collect all the questions and answers that have been given in the chat to share with all of you. And Aris Ismanto uh, uh, is addressing 
well, the three of you, and would like to ask related to the model that you have developed, what is the important input needs to be adjusted to apply the model in other area or minimum requirement data to run the model? Well, if I can start with the with the, the last, uh, the simplest model, then uh, you in principle don't need that much. You need a, a coastline um, uh, location. So, so you need coastlines, preferably historic coastlines, and also uh, uh, where the mangrove uh, line is, and you need wave and tidal and, 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 and wind data. Uh, which can be provided, for instance, by ERA-5. Uh, um, so you can start with very limited amount of, of data, uh, but um, uh, of course, when you want to zoom in on certain areas, you'll have to go more detailed. And then I give the floor happily to Sabrion or Mick to uh, see what you then need. Yes, for, for the DFM for model is basically almost similar like the requirements that you need for uh, 2D Delft 3D flexible mesh model. There you have these uh, detailed information on bathymetry, on the sediment concentration that is available in the part of area, uh, in the tidal water levels and waves that is can also be retrieved from the uh, larger scale observation that is available. But of course, what yeah, I can, I admit that the the most difficult data that you need to have is the vegetation data. That is mostly it is not available, especially in the developing countries that they are lack of observation on the mangrove forest. So one of the ways to do that is to utilize the remote sensing analysis that with that that you can have this information on how high the canopy mangrove is. So let's think of like a ISAT, uh, let's say a data sets or another light, lighter observation that you can have this uh, elef uh, elevation, canopy elevation model on, on your mangrove. And then you can also fly your drone to get this 3D representation on a mangrove and do this uh, reverse analysis that you can, you can, let's say, subtract the elevation model of mangrove with the elevation model that you can start with that information basically, but for the rest, that as long as you know on how to run the DFM model, that you can add information of vegetation, then you can you can do the the simulation. And for well, MFLAT, it will be by Mick. Probably. Yeah. Well, maybe because of time, I think you you kind of cover. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh... Thank you very much to all. Would you like to give the final remarks, uh, the speakers, Mick, Dano, Severian? Another oh, one. Here we go. I yes. would. Good pleasure. If I go first, then um, my invitation would be for all to uh, to join our efforts in uh, in trying to to uh, simulate your uh, your environments and uh, and see how far. You can get uh, in improving our understanding of mangrove coasts. So we need all the help we can get, and you're very welcome to join us. Mick, I, I tears in my eyes. I, I cannot agree more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sirian. Well, uh, I think that uh, restoring or conserving mangrove is a community effort. So then I hope that when you understand on the processes of mangroves, then you can, let's say, give more empathy on mangroves and the community behind it. So let's work together for our more resilient mangrove cause for the better future of us. Well, thank you very much to our speakers and thank you very much to all attendees and the person who has registered for this seminar. And again, I will uh, inform I inform you that this uh, recording, the recording of this seminar will be shared on the page of IHE Delft YouTube with open access. And all persons who have registered will receive the email with extra information that the speaker will uh, provide me. 
Thank you very much. And I hope that you enjoy maybe the next uh, seminar that will be in November and all information will be published accordingly in October. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.